Hey everybody, today we are going to be talking about movies that are really popular with a lot of people. Lots of people like it, maybe it has a lot of critical acclaim, but for whatever reason you strongly dislike it and you feel like maybe you're in the twilight zone or something. I think we all have examples of this, I know that I do, and I've done this topic video multiple times in the past and it tends to be a popular one. Licorice Pizza, the age gap, the obnoxious characters, and the lack of an actual plot. Um, okay, so when it comes to Licorice Pizza, I think that that film, like all Paul Thomas Anderson films, it's extraordinarily made. When I think about Paul Thomas Anderson films, I like to use the word like texture a lot when I talk about movies, when I talk about, you know, the feeling, the aesthetic, especially the authenticity of the world. And I rarely see movies that transport you to the era in which they take place like I do with Paul Thomas Anderson. To such an extent, I think he puts even the great directors to shame when it comes to, you know, creating an accurate depiction of history. I'll even go, I think he's way better than somebody like Scorsese, as example. Again, just so far as capturing the authenticity of the world, and especially when it comes to casting faces that really seem to be appropriate uh, within that time frame. It's like when you watch a movie like Licorice Pizza, the people that exist in that film, they look like they were born right out of the time, in the 1970s. I wasn't alive in the 1970s, and yet I feel like I was just based on the experience of watching uh, this film. And yet, as you say here, um, the age gap is a problem. And it is a problem with me where it sticks in my mind the more that I think about the film. It didn't bother me nearly as much the first time I saw it. I don't know why that is. I'll actually stand up for the obnoxious characters, as you say, because I actually think a lot of them are very colorful and very interesting. I loved Bradley Cooper in the film. He's not somebody that I love uh, typically, but I think when he has the right kind of role, especially when it comes to comedy, he can be fantastic. Though I actually do like the way that the story is structured. I like that it feels very episodic. Things do feel very uh, serendipitous. It has a feeling of like a, a summer, you know, again, a summer in the 1970s. And yet again, I cannot stop thinking about uh, the love story, which is really disturbing. And it's not the kind of disturbing where it's ever calling attention to it in the ways that I really feel it should have. And that's a big problem for me. And to be honest, it's been a while since I've thought about the movie, but I would love to know more about, I guess I should say the inspiration for Paul Thomas Anderson here because yeah, it's one of the few films where just morally I'm very conflicted with it in a way that I don't see myself letting up on that. Bohemian Rhapsody. Even as a Queen fan, it's embarrassing. No, because you are a Queen fan, it's embarrassing. That's what you meant to say. Megan. The only good part is the opening scene. Everything after that is hot garbage. Okay, I wish there were better explanations on some of these um, because hot garbage does not give me much to go off of, but um, I strongly disagree. I, I loved Megan. I actually, I debated putting that on my top 10 of the year just because, yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was very interesting and I was sad that it kind of got brushed aside after a while just because, yeah, I thought it was a really kind of bold, cohesive film, but it kind of knew what it was. It stayed in its lane. The film is obviously about AI and the accessibility of AI and how that's going to transition into the human world and perhaps some of the skepticisms humans have over that. Um, and yet it didn't feel like it was trying to be like real cerebral, like, you know, weighty sci-fi. It wasn't something like Ex Machina, which obviously deals with the same thing. I love Ex Machina, but again, this just felt kind of refreshing. I like that it's not weighing itself down with a lot of very like weighty themes. It's not taking itself too seriously. It is a horror comedy and that's, I don't know, the, the spin on that is very interesting. And it's very confident in its tone overall because it's able to take these sharp directions. It really jolts you in all of these different areas and yet, I don't know, it always felt very cohesive for me. Yes, the opening scene that you mentioned, I think it's really good because it's very emotional, surprisingly emotional. But you know, as the movie goes, it can get into something that feels very like, you know, sad, you're caring for the characters, and then it'll just do something that's really bizarre or brutal or funny, sometimes all in the same breath. I did kind of struggle with the corporate aspects. I know there was this whole kind of like Silicon Valley-esque aspect to the movie when it comes to the boss and you know the development of Megan, and I don't feel like the satire there was really fleshed out in a way that felt clever. I don't think it really matched the rest of the movie, but Megan, just the way that she's designed, I think is, is ingenious. First of all, she's terrifying, but also she's so close to being real. Why she works is what I always say. It's the combination of practical and digital. It's the fact that she is a mix of a, a live action performance, puppetry, and CGI. And you know, when she starts dancing and all of that, I, I was just sold. I loved the film. My Best Friend's Wedding. 
Julia Roberts' character is so morally bankrupt, it doesn't make for a fun experience to spend so much of the movie with her on screen. Her behavior isn't funny or redeeming in any way. She's just being a toxic home wrecker. The whole movie just rubbed me the wrong way as a result. Um, okay, so I, I love My Best Friend's Wedding. It is a movie that I consider to be one of the stronger ones when it comes to kind of like mid 90s romantic comedies, because there was a little bit more of a like an existential weight to it, especially with this one. There's a, a pain, a melancholy to it that I actually found to be uh, quite intriguing, it kind of opened up the story a little bit. First of all, I will say um, when it comes to your criticism, you know, and I, I say this a lot, but anytime someone says, I don't like a movie because the character was so morally bankrupt, I didn't want to follow them. And for me, it's like, mm, I don't really understand that criticism because we follow villains, we follow heroes, we follow anti-heroes all the time. You have no problem following Tony Soprano for six seasons, you know? And it's like, it's not necessarily about how morally bankrupt they are. I think it's more how they're handled in the writing. I really like the Julia Roberts character. I like that she's very much like kind of an independent 1990s type of woman in the sense that, yeah, like she's very guarded. And it's like, she can't express her emotions. She's very, you know, career driven, independent, all of that. But knowing that she had these feelings the whole time is I think what's interesting about it because it's going to escalate at a certain point. And I think there are some very interesting scenes that kind of show her humanity. And if we didn't have those scenes, then I think it would be a problem where I wouldn't want to follow her. But like, you know, the scene where it's like her and Derm Dermot Mulroney, they're like on a boat or something. I can't quite remember. And they're, they're, they're talking about moments passing them by, stuff like that, I think is really lovely and intimate, vulnerable. Oh, what am I talking about? The scene where she's in the hotel and she talks about that she's such a bad person and she has that, that lovely heart-to-heart -heart moment with uh, Paul Giamatti who gives a wonderful but brief performance. It's like those moments make her human. And again, as I say in the very end of the film, it's like she has to make that arc as a character you know, she has to have that moment where she accepts that it's not going to happen. She has to accept that she is not going to get to have her happy ending and she has to step aside and let somebody else have it. The reason why I like that it's handled, first of all, it, it creates a more interesting climax. The stakes are higher, but really I think her character is just that stubborn, just that bitter, and just that psychologically messed up to where I think she would take it just to those levels before she realized, oh crap, I am going to lose something major. I am going to have to accept this. So when she's accepting things in the end, it's only more because she's forced to. And then out of that, she's going to learn to become a better person, I think. And I think you do see that in the end of the film. Again, it's just a little bit more complicated. I think it's, again, melancholy. The ending is not some happy thing. Probably La La Land. Granted, I've only seen it once, but for some reason I just can't get behind it. I actually don't mind musicals and have really enjoyed Damien Chazelle's other films a lot. I think Ryan Gosling's character is really unlikable in the worst kind of way. From what I remember, he just whines a lot throughout the movie. It also had a lot of hype around it, 11 Oscar nominations, I believe, for a story that is incredibly pedestrian. Even on a technical level, I don't quite understand its praise. So many other filmmakers have done the long take over and over and over again. So I don't understand what makes the opening highway sequence so impressive when it's been done to death by countless filmmakers in better films. Just my opinion. I have to agree with you. <laughs> I have to agree with you. Um, I, look, people know that I'm a, a musical purist. I love musicals and I love filmmakers who understand musicals, especially from the MGM era, like the 1950s. And I mean, you know, previous to that as well. Damien Chazelle gets it. He understands the specificity, the detail, and he has an amazing musical mind, I think, just like he has an ear for everything. And that made him perfect to make this type of film. When I saw Whiplash, I thought, well, this man has to make a musical next. I remember thinking that, um, and I was so happy that he did. And I will say this, I think La La Land is pretty spectacular from a spectacle standpoint. I think it's a beautifully made film overall. And I do think actually that people like Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire, I think they would applaud him. Genuinely, I think that they would. That said, I have to agree with a lot of the things you're saying here. It's beautiful epic, all of those things, and yet it's not matching a lot of its influences. And I remember thinking that at the time. I remember thinking that especially about the ballet sequence. It's just kind of like a mishmash of all of these things we've seen better in other films, but it wasn't even that cleverly implemented. It just felt like, you know, like greatest hits of 1950s musicals, 1930s musicals. I remember being like, oh yeah, I saw that in Singing in the Rain, but it was done way better with way more ambition and cohesion, or, oh yeah, I remember seeing that in Broadway Melody of like 1940. And yes, again, 
Fred Astaire, Eleanor Powell did it far better. And not saying that people like Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone can dance on the level of them, that's, that's not what I mean, but it's just that there's something missing from La La Land in the sense that it is just a pastiche more than anything. And I don't think that the love story really holds up, and that's the problem. Because I think the film, you know, it has this idea of, you know, bringing in all of these elements, these nostalgic elements from old Hollywood, but it's trying to combine it with the melancholy of the present. Um, and by doing that, it's bringing in kind of like the Umbrellas of Schoenberg kind of melancholy to it. But I'm sorry, but like that just has the music to Umbrellas of Schoenberg. It's just on another level. Justin Hurwitz is great. You know, he understands a certain type of music, absolutely, and I, I love him for it. But l let's face it, he's not particularly complex as a musician. A lot of his material does feel very second rate. Very catchy, and some of it I love, but it's just, it's a little one note. And I think, especially La La Land, there's a lot of stuff going on that I love. Big horn sections, and you know, City of Stars is quite lovely, but ultimately kind of simplistic. I agree with you that the Ryan Gosling character is unlikable, but again, I don't have a problem with unlikable characters, but again, it's more how uh, the screenwriter handles them, the director, whatever. Um, and in this case, I felt like the Gosling character didn't really work. I didn't buy his transition from kind of like this bitter guy into falling in love with the Emma Stone character, whereas Emma, I bought completely her arc. So there's just a little bit of a disconnect, and it is, it's fine if you just want to make a love letter to Hollywood. I just wish there had been more to it, where it really rose above its influences a little bit more. Like you said, that opening sequence is, is really spectacular. I love it, but it doesn't really connect to anything, which you know, in theory is fine because there's a lot of old musicals where there are just random musical numbers set and they, they have nothing to do with any of the rest of the story. So I get that. But it seemed like they were going more for like that West Side Story kind of thing. And I just, again, I don't think that it has the same kind of pathos and the same kind of epic power. And this is why I'm such a fan of Babylon, which is way more messy. I mean, it is just like a diuretic explosion compared to how clean La La, Aunt, La, La Land is, how simple and quaint and everything is. Um, but I like Babylon because it really goes for it. It is Damien trying to, you know, make a point about something. He's feeling that movie. And I mean, he's feeling angry maybe and frustrated and conflicted as a director in Hollywood these days. He's not just making a movie about like the roaring 20s and, and the transition into sound just because he loves that era. He's doing it to make a point about today, how political everything is and how that leads you to having to water down art to a degree. And then it leads to the romanticism of, of race and, and gender, sexuality. And while not as extreme of a transition, it's definitely there. And he's kind of making a point about cycles and the existential quality when it comes to being an artist. And while that movie, again, is a complete train wreck and it's one of the more frustrating movies I've seen in years, I think it's got things about it that are inspiring and amazing and really interesting. I think it was the most interesting Damien has ever been as a director. Saltburn. Everything I dislike about modern films that are trying to be edgy but lack an ounce of originality and any depth beyond the obvious can be found in this film. Yeah, so I mean, I recommend watching my review for that one because I was so torn on my experience with it. It's like when people say things like this, I'm like, yes. 100% you are right. And yet there is a part of me that still feels there's something to Saltburn and thinks there is something to Emerald Fennell, even though there's a lot about her that I dislike. I do agree that it often feels like she is hiding behind a lot of her references and hiding behind her style, her aesthetic. I said it about her, I said it about several directors, but there's just this inflated sense of delusion with a lot of directors where they feel like they have to have all of these academic references and all of these very like postmodern film references. And it's like, just because you, you use them in, in the film, even if it's really well done, I don't really understand what we're supposed to gain from it. Saltburn is incredibly manipulative. And I mean, all films are manipulative, but in a way that really rubs me the wrong way that I don't think serves the story. It definitely doesn't serve the experience. I think you would gain a lot more from the film had you known who Oliver is and what his point is supposed to be. I think what would have been much more interesting is kind of discovering his vulnerabilities through his connection with the uh, Jacob Elordi character and then always keeping that ambition in focus rather than delaying it. I don't understand the point of that other than just, you know, basic suspenseful manipulation. We've seen better examples of this in a million different kind of gothic uh, horror films or even like talented Mr. Ripley. There's all kinds of different references that she is using. Now I will say in her defense, I mean, like I said, she has amazing taste and her team, whoever they are, they, they know how to do it for sure. And I do think 
even though she's using all kinds of tired tropes and things, she does infuse them with something that is a little spicy, a little bit interesting, at least I think so. There are enough things in Saltburn that had me titillated, I will say. I'll even say riveted, even if it wasn't necessarily earned. Like, you know, that final scene where um, uh, Barry Kyogen is dancing. Uh, some people like that scene, some people don't. Some people don't feel that it's earned. I agree that it's not earned, and yet I sit there and imagine the type of movie if it had been earned, and I think it would have been a fabulous, fabulous ending. I still think it's a really cool ending, I just want it to be attached to more. So honestly, I'm still in the kind of torn category. I remember when I did my review, I talked about if I see this again, I might hate it a lot more and maybe like it more at the same time. That's honestly exactly how I felt. I found myself getting hooked into a lot of those eccentric elements and I found, you know, like performances like Rosamund Pike to be really fantastic. But having said all of that, I do think a lot of the problems that I had did feel like they were bubbling more to the surface that second time. So yeah, I don't know if I see Saltburn holding up that well. I can see it being kind of one of those weird kind of culty movies that people reference now and again in some years, but I don't know, maybe it will have a, a shelf life. And yeah, so those are a few of the answers that you guys gave. Thank you so much for writing in. We will do another one at some point, but that is the video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to plug my website as always. It is deepfocuslens.com. I'm an artist, I do commission portraits, and I sell prints of my work. If you are interested in any of that, you can always go to the website below. And if you have a question about a commission or a print, you can email me. My email is in the description box below as well. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to my patrons who are great guys. Thank you so much for your support. If you are interested in supporting, the link for that is below, as well as the rest of my social media information. You can watch more videos here, and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.